Dr. Johnson is a consultant musculoskeletal radiologist um, at the Nuffield Orthopaedic Center, where she also works with that uh, large bone infection unit in Oxford. She's trained um, in radiology at Charing Cross and Mary's, and also did a fellowship at the Chelsea in Westminster and Toronto, Canada. At the very end of your little CV here, you say you have a life appointment as a member, a medical member of the Ministry of Justice. I'd be very interested in knowing more about that, but <laughs> perhaps we can talk about that later. Welcome. Um, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. I appreciate the opportunity. I'm going to talk today about the role of um, MRI and CT in diabetic foot assessment. Yesterday you had um, a talk from my excellent colleague Rick Whitehouse on radiographic assessment. I will touch a little bit on radiographs, but I'll predominantly focus on MRI and CT. Um, so what I'll go through is I'll talk about the imaging pathways for osteomyelitis. We'll go through the salient imaging features. I'll talk about the mimics and the coexisting conditions. Um, but as I said before, the primary focus will be on cross-sectional imaging, so MR and CT for that. Um, and what is the value of imaging? And um, uh, We are just get busier and busier radiologists every day. Um, in terms of what we do, and uh, imaging is great when you're assessing the diabetic foot, so helps to determine the presence and the location of any um, osseous and soft tissue involvement. It will um, show you any collections, it will help you review the um, involvement of any adjacent structures. We use it to plan procedures, so for aspirations or biopsies, um, and also it helps to plan the surgical approach and also helps to manage the follow-up of patients. In terms of which modality we would use, so radiographs are usually uh, the first modality, and we do always still like to have a radiograph um, uh, to correlate with any cross-sectional imaging. What you can see here is this is the lateral radiograph of the hind foot. One of the features that you know when you look at this that the patient has diabetes is that calcification of the small arteries. You only see that in the setting of diabetes. That's always something that's really helpful. Um, for us to see, but there's definite features and strengths of radiographs that uh, uh, supersede um, MR and CT. Um, generally speaking, the acute setting, uh, radiographs tend to be less sensitive. The soft tissue spelling, uh, swelling is quite nonspecific. Really helpful for looking for other features such as fracture, tumour, arthritis, foreign bodies. We can completely walk past a foreign body on MRI. Um, the bony changes that you tend to see tend to be delayed compared to how quickly you would see them with an MRI. Um, radiographs are, however, fantastic for assessing cortical erosion, and you can sometimes see cortical erosion on an X-ray before you can appreciate it on an MRI. Um, and it gives you a really good um, overview of the anatomy and gross destruction. So when we have somebody with an advanced Charcot's, for example, we really want a radiograph sitting next to that MRI examination just to give us uh, that overview and that understanding of where we've lost the anatomy. Um, and as I said, it's a, it's a really excellent baseline rate, um, imaging modality to have. Uh, what you can see here, so subtle changes just at the fifth metatarsal head when you have the lucency, the cortical destruction. We can see over here in the oblique radiograph that soft tissue swelling, those little pockets of air. Um, in the soft tissue, so in the setting of infection. This is one that's uh, much more advanced. You can see the cortical destruction, the osteomyelitis spreading into a septic arthritis, and here you can see the multifocal involvement of several bones and that, uh, that cortical destruction and that associated soft tissue swelling that comes with it. Um, I will briefly touch on ultrasound because that certainly has a role to play. So. Ultrasound is great at looking at the soft tissue, so it's, a, it's easy to access, it's inexpensive, there's no radiation. Um, as well as looking at the soft tissues, it can also demonstrate subperiosteal collections. And you have the benefit with ultrasound, of, for the radiologist there's a huge benefit because you can see the patient. And we'll see a scan and we might get a sentence for the clinical information, but that ability to, to see the patient and to look at the foot is really helpful for us. Um, some hospitals have uh, PAC systems where you can actually put a, a photograph of, of, of the patient on there, which you can see. I don't have the benefit of that in Oxford, but 
Um, we will often sometimes struggle, say for example, in the context of a very small superficial ulcer or, or somebody with quite extensive kind of changes to see clinically what is it that you're worried about or has that skin broken, is it closed over? So really helpful for us to be able to see the patient and we're very reliant on the clinical information that we get in terms of interpreting the scan. Um, Soft tissue abscesses will present as a hypoechoic collection. Hypoechoic just means dark, and you have peripheral vascularized rim of um, increased activity that's part of the inflammation. And ultrasound is definitely superior to an x ray with this. And ultrasound also lets us, if possible, uh, if needed, do an aspiration and/or a biopsy. So these are two ultrasound images. So on the left, so that's the skin surface there. This is a soft tissue collection, so you can see it has that irregular wall within it. This is hypochoic, so it's dark, but this is actually a pus, so it's very complex. It has these brighter, more hyperechoic areas in it. And this is the fat surrounding this, and the fat is extremely bright, and that's one of the features that you get with inflammation. Um, this is again another, um, that's the skin surface, so uh, that's the heel of the foot. And what you can see there when you get these very, very bright pockets is uh, that's air, so that's locules of air within the soft tissues. And locules of air on an ultrasound look white, and then on an MRI they look black. So they don't necessarily correlate in what they look like across the different modalities. So CT is a great problem-solving tool, and it's really useful for evaluating, particularly in the foot, when you have such complex anatomy. Um, it gives you information regarding cortical destruction, a sequestrum, is there an involucrum, um, is there a cloaca? Sequestrum particularly is very easy for us to walk past if you have a tiny one on MRI. Um, and, uh, yeah, as I said, particularly if you have somebody who's not responding, so if in an MDT someone says, oh, they're not really responding to antibiotic therapy, they have MRI imaging, etc., I'll often at that stage recommend a CT, just see if there's a little sequestrum in there. Um, again, so we use CT for um, biopsies. Um, uh, for the foot, we can often biopsy if needed under ultrasound or under fluoroscopy, um, including bone biopsies for that. So this is an example of CT um, images. So this is uh, looking at the foot in a sagittal plane. So this is the calcaneus um, there, so that's the subtalar joint. And what you can see there is that soft tissue ulceration in that air and those little locules um, of air within it. So this is a coronal image of the calcaneus. And what you can see there is this is what normal cortex looks like. It's that really well-defined, crisp white line. When you come down here, this is um, where you have uh, cortical erosion. So when you get subtle changes of cortical erosion um, in there. This is a 3D uh, volumetric reconstruction. Radiologists do not find 3D reconstructions whatsoever helpful, um, but they love them in the MDT. So we just put up 3D reconstructions. And the surgeons really love looking at them, but they don't particularly give us any diagnostic information. We can also throw colour in, and then people really like it if there's colour in <laughs> Um, so nuclear medicine, again, I'll touch on that briefly. Uh, so lots we can do, SPECT, PET, bone marrow evaluation. Um, a really basic understanding of nuclear medicine is you just need to look for something hot. So just look for something orange or yellow, and that's where there's something going on. And it's extremely sensitive, but it's not very specific. So we can say there's increased activity in that area, but we can't always tell you exactly what it is. But it's a fantastic problem-solving tool. As I said, extremely sensitive. Uh, PET CT, we saw some images of that in the previous talk. PET MRI, that's, um, uh, that's still in kind of its research phase, but really promising preliminary results with sensitivity for 100%. You can definitely access nuclear medicine. You have to ask for it um, uh, from the nuclear medicine physicians. Um, nuclear medicine physicians are slightly different from radiologists. Uh, some of them are radiologists. Others are just trained in nuclear medicine. but. The radiologists are trying to get their images as crisp and as sharp as possible, and the nuclear medicine physicians are trying to make them as ill-defined um, as you can. But generally, what you're looking for with it is just look for the bright spots and the hot spots. Um, with that, so this is an example of, uh, say, the head of the fifth metatarsal. You can see that, uh, that cortical destruction, that remodeling. Um, they all have a soft tissue ulcer there, and you can see the increased activity there. So this is... Um, 
where the osteomyelitis is. And actually what you can see there, those darker parts, because remember on CT and on MRI, air is dark. You can see these little locules of air next to it. Uh, MRI that a lot of us um, uh, will use is a, a real workhorse when it comes to the imaging of infection or of Charcot's. So the sensitivity for the diagnosis of osteomyelitis is different depending on what, what paper you read it sort of in the acute period, but it's been reported to be as high as 82 to 100 percent, and uh, specificity is uh, kind of between 75 to 99 percent. I have an extremely low threshold for an MRI, um, if ever asked for in these patients. Um, it doesn't just give you the diagnosis of the osteomyelitis, but it lets you look at the complications, so the soft tissues, uh, is it just an osteomyelitis? Is it a septic arthritis? Is there a tenosynovitis um, associated with it? You can generally see bone marrow changes within three to five days. That's quite early, and probably now with the newer scanners, you can see it even sooner. It's very helpful, both the initial treatment and planning their follow-up. The thing to be wary of with MRI is once you start treating a patient, the images lag behind the picture. So we can have ongoing edema and inflammation on an MRI scan, and in MDT, the clinicians are saying, well, you know, their inflammatory markers are much better, and clinically they're much better, but the MRI still looks the same and actually can sometimes initially look worse. If you image them too soon, uh, the T2 and the stir changes can go up. So you need to treat the patient, not the picture. And don't image them again too soon unless something has changed clinically, because if you image them too soon, it just throws you off, because you think... The scan isn't getting better, but my patient is getting better. Um, <clears throat> what we're looking for, so basics of the sequences that we use are, you will use either a T2 fat saturated or a stir sequence, and all that does is you make fat black and you're lifting up fluid. So fluid is bright. So all you're looking for is bright fluid, which is this sequence here and then a T1 sequence. And on a T1 sequence, your fluid is always uh, dark, but your fat is bright. So what you have um, here, so this is um, a sagittal um, MRI of the foot. Um, you can see they've had an amputation. You can see there's all that diffuse kind of soft tissue inflammation as well, and you can start to see changes in the bone, and those are effusions. And people always hone in on the T2 and the stir sequence because that's where you see the abnormality most. But actually, that's a bit of a mistake, and I'll go through it. It's the T1 that is the most sensitive for giving you the information, because on a T2 or a stir, so when you're essentially looking for infection or fluid, you can't necessarily differentiate between infection and reactive marrow edema. Then you run the risk of overcalling it. Um, what you can see here on this image is, so this again is a sagittal. This is the first metatarsophalangeal joint. Um, so, as I said here, so fluid is bright. So there's lots of edema in the soft tissues. There's all this high signal in the metatarsal head. There's high signal on the other side. So there's a septic arthritis and an osteomyelitis. There's fluid within the joint. Um, and when you look at this, this looks like there's infection here and there's infection all along there. But the trick is to look at the T1. And what happens is when you get infection is you get replacement of fat. So this is where the osteomyelitis is, and this is really important, so particularly in patients who have surgical planning, um, not to overcall it. So you don't say, oh, I think it's infected all the way up to there. It's actually the T1 that shows you the degree of infection. So this is as much that is infected. The rest of the stuff here that looks bright on that stir, that's actually just reactive edema because the fat is preserved on the T1. So you always have to go back and correlate to your T1 sequence. What you can see beautifully, um, not sure where that's from, I don't think it's me, I don't have my phone on me. Uh, what you can see beautifully uh, from here as well is the, um, uh, that ulcer at the plantar aspect of the foot. Um, same thing again here, so you can see that destruction of that joint, all that reactive inflammation. And this is another example of the calcaneus um, here, so all that soft tissue inflammation. We're looking at the cortex, so remember when we looked at the cortex on the CT, the cortex was white, on the MRI the cortex is black, so you see that line and you just think of yourself, if I got a pencil, could I trace it all the way around, could I follow that cortex round? And so the question we'll often get asked is, is that reactive marrow edema or is that infection? 
And one of the features is you think, can I see that cortex? Get your pencil, trace it around, and you can see it, you can see it, and then it just disappears there. And this is where you have the cortical erosion. And you can see that large ulcer there in the heel. Um, so additional findings uh, in the setting of osteomyelitis, so soft tissue ulceration, of phlegmon, abscesses, sinus tracts, and as I showed you, the cortical bone destruction. Um, this is a coronal um, image. You can see uh, that ulceration here and also there as well. Um, and you can see the changes in the joint and all that reactive kind of inflammation going around. Um, chronic osteomyelitis, I won't dwell on this. Um, this is something that we're predominantly looking at on radiographs. I don't know what that sound is. I'm going to take my watch off. I think it's something else. Is it up there? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, but it does seem to have stopped. <laughs> it's Apple monitoring me. Um, uh, you can see that. Uh, so there's chronic osteomyelitis, that kind of complete um, uh, uh, cortical erosion there. But actually, they do also have... Um, uh, a shark case as well with that reorganization of the midfoot. So I'm talking predominantly now about osteomyelitis, and I'm going to talk about shark and then we're going to go through the overlap because it's often really hard uh, for us to differentiate it. Um, this here, just another example of a, it's actually a beautiful example. So this is an axial of the foot, that's the hind foot, um, and this is the um, a, uh, an ulcer coming through, and there's that uh, big intraosseous collection, which is chronic, which you can see there. So that's the T1, so fat is bright, and this is uh, a stir or a T2 fat sat, so fat is dark, but fluid is bright on that. So just in terms of, I'll briefly touch on the terminology that we use. So the sequestrum is when you have a fragment of necrotic or infected bone um, that's separated from the viable bone. It doesn't have a blood flow, and these are the patients who don't tend to respond to antibiotic therapy because that's a chronic seed of infection that's in there, and it basically forms a, a nidus for chronic infection that can persist for many years. So we see quite a lot of these um, uh, in Oxford. Um, in velucrum, so it's when you get that inflammatory reaction of osteoclastic activity and the periosteal new bone formation, and that's the body attempting to wall off the sequestrum. Um, and cloaca is the communication from which the pus can be discharged from the envelucrum. And we just like to throw the, the, the words kind of around in our reports, but the main thing is really the sequestrum. And um, as I said before, CTs or an X-ray are really brilliant at picking those up when we might miss them on MR. In terms of gadolinium, uh, gadolinium is not necessary for the diagnosis of osteomyelitis. We'll routinely get asked for scans with gadolinium, intravenous gadolinium. These patients can often have poor renal function, so you need to be mindful of giving them GAD. Um, gadolinium doesn't show you anything that you shouldn't be able to see already on the previous imaging. What it does is it shows it slightly better, and it increases your confidence that it's infection, but gadolinium is not anything that we'll routinely give. Um, it'll show you your intraosseous abscesses, your soft tissue abscesses very well, and it'll certainly show them to you better. And there might be times when you have little collections that you can only appreciate with GAD, but generally speaking, it's not something that we'll give routinely. Um, what it is helpful for is uh, um, differentiating viable tissue from necrotic regions, so we'll use that for our slightly trickier cases. Um, and uh, this, some, some people will argue that giving contrast is is helpful if you can't see anything, but I, in my experience, I don't think so. I think if you can't see anything on the scan before, with gadolinium, you're looking for an abnormality to enhance it. If you can't see anything on the previous scan, you're very unlikely to find much with GAD. Um, what is overcalled with osteomyelitis? So that reactive marrow edema, and I, I know I keep repeating it, but it's really important because it just always gets overcalled um, as an osteomyelitis. So if we look at this, so this is a sagittal of the foot, and if you look at that, you can see that big ulcer, the heel kind of going up, that sinus tract, and the whole calcaneus is of abnormal signal. And this was initially reported as an osteomyelitis going all the way through. But if you look at the corresponding T1, the osteomyelitis is extensive. So you can see it goes up to there, but it doesn't go up to the subtalar joint. This here is reactive marrow edema. You can still see fat in it. That's not infection. In terms of differentiating a neuropathic osteoarthropathy from osteomyelitis, they can definitely coexist and mimic each other, and this is something that we often find tricky. 
um, uh, especially when they do coexist. Um, as a general rule, the edema that you get in a neuropathic foot is subarticular. You'll see it in several bones, and it's subarticular or subcortical. Whereas with osteomyelitis, it tends to be involved. It's not subarticular. It tends to involve more of the bone. The distribution is uh, usually different, so we see more MR changes in a neuropathic foot in the midfoot. Whereas with infection, you tend to see more of the changes uh, where they're putting mechanical pressure, so in the hind foot or the forefoot. With the Charcot's, um, you'll look for features such as uh, subchondral cysts and intraarticular bodies. Um, there was a, a, a comment earlier regarding um, uh, whether or not an osteomyelitis can then cause features that look like a Charcot's, and on imaging, I think it can, because once you have osteomyelitis or septic arthritis, you get secondary degenerative changes, and then you see the degenerative features, and then at that stage, it's quite hard to separate them out. Um, and this goes through what I said, so the different distribution patterns um, and where we kind of tend to see the edema. In terms of if we're trying to work out, is this a Charcot foot with a superimposed infection? Uh, what you're looking for is the loss of the subchondral cysts and the intraarticular body. So all those degenerative features tend to disappear if you have um, a superimposed infection. Um, the ghost sign, this is when gadolinium is useful. Um, and it's useful when you're trying to differentiate somebody who has a Charcot but a superimposed osteomyelitis. So when we give gadolinium, we give gadolinium to T1 sequences only. We don't give gadolinium to T2 or to STIR. And we tend to saturate out the fat. So your pre-gadolinium scan will be a fat sat T1. So everything is dark. Fluid is dark. Fat is dark. Then you'll give them gadolinium, and then you'll look for anything to light up. And what happens if they have an infection, superimposed in a Charcot, is on that first scan, when everything's dark, you can't see the cortex. It just all looks very blurry. But when you give gadolinium, the cortex suddenly appears. And that's what is called the ghost sign. So you can't see it before you give GAD, and then it suddenly appears after you've given GAD. Um, acute phase of disease with a, um, a, a Charcot foot, so the radiographic, you can get very subtle changes, but they can be normal. Um, I won't dwell on this classification system. You either love classification systems or you don't. That's the um, Einschatz classification system that's probably been mentioned uh, on previous talks. This is a good example of what a classic early neuropathic foot looks like, and this is the stage that we should be picking them up on MRI. So this is the midfoot, whereas the previous examples of infection I've shown you have been in the hindfoot or the forefoot. So this is predominantly seen in the midfoot. Um, this is a stir sequence, so fluid is bright, everything else is dark. Um, and what you can see is the edema is predominantly um, subarticular or subcortical. It's there, it's there, and it's there, and it goes across several um, different joints in the midfoot. So this is kind of what that, sh what that early kind of um, neuroarthropathy will look like. Um, and this again summarizes what I said regarding the distribution of it. So infection predominantly been seen those weight bearing areas where it was with a Charcot, we see it more in the, the midfoot. But then also when you have an osteomyelitis with a Charcot, we do see that in the midfoot again. Uh, this radiograph here uh, demonstrates the features that you get uh, with a neuropathic foot. So again, predominantly midfoot complete disorganization, destruction, sclerosis of it, secondary degenerative changes. You can see how swollen that whole foot is. And this is the MRI features. So again, that marrow edema that's predominantly kind of that subcortical change, lots of soft tissue inflammation, none on this patient. So this is a crone of the foot, none really going down to the plantar aspect of the foot, which is where um, if they had an ulcer, you'd expect it to be going. This is the corresponding patient's nuclear medicine scan. As you can see, typical nuclear medicine, really vague, really blurry. All that you're looking for is just where does it light up. Um, so what you're looking for with a classic neuropathic foot is the five Ds um, of it. So increased density, sclerosis, which you can see there. Um, distension with effusions, that's something you can see clinically, or we see that on ultrasound or MRI destruction, debris, disorganization, and dislocations, just that complete remodeling. And it's really, if we're, we're um, 
we're finding this tricky on uh, on imaging. It's always really helpful for us if we have a clinical detail saying, you know, how symptomatic are they, et cetera, what was the onset of it, what are their inflammatory markers doing, because they can be hard, particularly in the early stages, to differentiate. Um, this is an example of a rocker bottom foot when there's a secondary to collapse of the arch, and you can see it there. And then what they have is their subsequent uh, risk of a midfoot ulceration, and then that will then make them more at risk of developing an osteomyelitis from that. Uh, nearing the end, so I'll just briefly touch on other MR imaging techniques that we we can use. So you might hear your radiologist say um, in MDTs, the MDT approach I find hugely helpful for managing these. Uh, Dixon sequences are essentially when you have better fat suppression, so more homogenous fat suppression. The foot is difficult to image, it's peripheral, there's lots of air around it. We tend to try and get as small a field of view as possible because that gives you much higher resolution. Large field of view though will include the whole foot, so you'll pick up a lot more of it, but it's more prone to artifact, especially at the peripheries of the, of the image. So places like uh, your base of your fifth metatarsal or your forefoot, you get a lot of artifact on that with large field of view imaging. Um, and that's why if, if clinically you think it's a real specific part of the foot, then ideally image just that, but if it's more a global thing, then certainly image the whole foot, but just be wary that the resolution will go down. Um, and you might get slightly less information, a bit more artifact, but sequences of imaging modalities such as Dixon sequences should help with that. Diffusion weighted imaging, something we started doing quite a bit of, do a little bit less of now. We use it now more, the, more for tumor work. Um, uh, looks at the movement of water molecules in evaluating osteomyelitis versus edema. There's lots of different ways of using dynamic contrast enhanced MRI. Again, we went through a phase of doing that. We've now just gone back to our sturdy workhorse kind of sequences. Um, and geography, that's what something we'll do sometimes for surgical planning uh, to map out vessels. Um, neurography imaging, so such as diffusion tensor imaging, that gives us quantitative information regarding nerve damage. Sure. Last little thing, fat is your friend when you're looking at an MRI, so that's the main thing to look at. Thank you very much.